Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Welcome back to another episode of the Work From Home Show. I'm your host, Naresh Fissa, with my co-host, Adam Schrader. And we have a guest with us, my really, really good friend. He's written the foreword to one of my books, Trump Book. I've known him for, I think, 11 or 12 years now, dating all the way back to when he was the Libertarian vice presidential nominee back in 2008. He's the founder of Winning Edge and number one best-selling author of too many books to name. I mean, he, this guy is a prolific author. But today we're going to be discussing one of his books that is relevant to all of you, and that is called The Power of Relentless, Seven Secrets to Achieving Mega Success, Financial Freedom, in the Life of Your Dreams. It's super timely to today's environment, the work-at-home environment, the current recession that we're in. I mean, it could be a depression. Wayne Allen Root, welcome to the Work From Home Show. Hey, gentlemen, Adam, Narish, how are you? Great to be with you. Great to have you. Yep, and uh, Wayne, so tell us a little bit about this book, The Power of Relentless. You wrote it a while ago. This was before the pandemic. This was, um, I think this was even before President Trump got elected. Yeah, yeah, I think it was 2015. It was right right before he went down the escalator. Uh, (laughs) I might have written it in 14, and then it came out in 2015. Uh, early in the year. So no, when I wrote it, when it was published, I should say, the moment it was out, nobody knew that Trump was running yet. But right after that, he announced within a few months, and I actually sent it to him and got a, uh, a quote from him, and we added it to the back of the book, uh, oh, you know, nice. an endorsement quote for Wayne Root and the Power of Relentless. That was really nice, too, of Donald Trump to do that while he was running for president. And believe me when I tell you, Trump's a great guy, but he never endorses anybody else's books or products if he's not in it or he's not getting paid, (laughs) and he wasn't in it and he's not getting paid. So I'm pretty amazing. I pulled off something that nobody else could. Awesome, awesome. Well, tell us a little (laughs) bit about uh, the term relentless, why it's so important, and the secrets that you kind of learned over your many years of successful entrepreneurship in achieving mega success and financial freedom. Well, you know, relentless is a pretty big umbrella. I mean, my book was a pretty big book, and there are a lot of – Uh, you know, key points underneath that umbrella of relentless, but they all come back to being relentless. They all come back to being a hustler. They all come back to always pitching, never bitching. That's kind of one of my favorite statements in life. You know, you you can bitch all you want. Nobody cares. They've got their own problems. They just don't give a damn. Nobody's ever (laughs) cared about any of my problems in my whole life. So why mention it? You know, only talk about your positives, never your negatives, because no one's ever going to help you. So good luck. You know, the more you complain, the more they think you're a loser. So don't even mention your problems. Always deal with you know, and focus on, like a laser, your positives. That's the only thing you should ever talk to anyone about because if you talk to them about your negatives, they don't want to do business with you. They don't want to be your friend. They don't want to be your lover. No one wants to hang out with a loser who's complaining all the time. So you've got to have a positive <laughs> attitude, and you've got to be relentlessly positive, relentlessly uh, optimistic, relentlessly high energy, relentlessly enthusiastic. In other words, everything I believe in, energy, enthusiasm, optimism, all starts with the word relentless. You've got to do it all the time. Relentlessly bold. You know, you've got to have relentless balls of steel, as I say. You know, relentless courage, relentless faith in God, faith in you. Every, uh, relentless pitching. You've got to pitch all day long, relentlessly. Just keep at it and at it and at it. You know, kind of like George Washington. George Washington kept chopping at the cherry tree and eventually fell down. And that's the lesson in life. You know, you just got to keep chopping, chopping, chopping. I'm a big fan of, of uh, George Washington. I'm a big fan of Winston Churchill. You know, I've written about him in several of my books that he just failed thousands and thousands of times. Basically, his whole life was a failure till the very end when he became prime minister of England at the right moment, World War II, and basically saved England and saved the world from Hitler and Nazi Germany. So he goes down in history as the greatest leader of the 20th century and one of the great leaders in world history, but his whole life was a failure till he turned like 70. 
And so that's what I call relentless, you know? Same thing with, uh, same thing with Donald Trump, I believe. Not that he was a failure. He was one of the world's biggest billionaire successes and has been successful in more things than anybody in history, probably. I mean, nobody else has ever been, you know, a billionaire businessman success and a great salesman and a great brander and a great uh, host of TV shows and a great producer of TV shows and, and uh, president of the United States. That combination has never been before. So he's always been successful. But along the way, you know, as I've written in, in many articles, Trump had a lot of failures along the way. You know, the very things that people hate him like to point out are basically true. I mean, there aren't too many people that fail in casinos. He failed a few times in casino business. And he failed, you know, with Trump Airlines, and he failed with Trump this and Trump that, Trump Champagne. There, there were a million different Trump ventures that failed. And yet, in the end, he proves my point, which is kind of the key joke of Relentless. I always tell the joke, you know, what do you call a restaurant owner who has ten restaurants and nine of them go out of business? And you call them a millionaire. You only need one. And mm -hmm. so that's my philosophy in life. And so I think it applies very uniquely and strongly to what, what's going on in the world and in America right now as we record this interview, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic, a coronavirus pandemic, and most of the world is hiding in their homes, waiting to die. And from the very beginning, I said, I'm not one of those people who ever, ever called it a hoax, by the way, never. It's very real. Lots of people are dying, but we've had pandemics throughout history, and nobody ever closed businesses before. And most people did not hide in their homes and, and would not want to come out because they're so afraid. I've never had a moment of fear. As a matter of fact, back in early March, when it was getting really bad before they locked down the whole economy, I had three events scheduled with hundreds of people waiting to see me who I knew would all want to shake my hand, hug me, kiss me, and get right in my face. And I went to all three events, and I hugged them, and I kissed them, and I got right in their face. And I've never gotten coronavirus. My point is positive attitude and be relentless. You can't hide in your home waiting to die. I'd rather be out and take a chance on dying and run my business and not lose everything I've got than be one of these incredibly ignorant people that's hiding in their home waiting to die for a disease that, that 98% of the people who get it recover. Why, why would you hide your home? I, I would have never shut businesses down. Big mistake to shut the economy down. Everybody who's healthy and relatively young, under the age of 60, should be out going to school, going to work, running your business, being an employee, being an executive. There's no reason for anybody to hide. And I said this from day one, and I've turned out to be right, because uh, an Israeli professor of medicine <clears throat> just studied every country in the world's response to coronavirus, by the way, just so you know, just came out. And now, you know, the media, of course, is, is hiding this from everybody. They don't want you to know this. And he, what the professor found out was whether you close your economy and lock everyone away or whether you let everybody out and you keep the economy wide open and everyone continues not just doing business but going to restaurants and bars and nightclubs, he said there's no difference. The same amount of people get sick in each country percentage-wise per capita, same amount get sick and the same amount die. So you never had to close your economy. Everybody's going to get exposed to it anyway, and some tiny percentage will die, and almost every one of them will be very old and very sick, and we should have just put all of our money, billions of dollars, into protecting those who are in that high-risk group who are very old and very sick, and we should have protected nursing homes. But let everybody else live their life and do business. Well, guess what? The economy's in shambles. We may be entering a Great Depression, probably are already in one, a worldwide Great Depression. We've ruined tens of millions of lives. Lots of people are going to commit suicide over the next 10 years, far more than ever would have gotten sick or, or ever would have died from coronavirus. We should not have done it this way. But I, Wayne Root, didn't do it this way because I'm relentless. I've continued doing business the entire time. At this point, it's been, uh, I'd say, about seven weeks since we locked down the world. And I've done seven weeks of business, and I'm probably the only guy in the world whose radio show has gained more new advertisers than lost. As a matter of fact, I gained one new one this morning before the phone rang, and it was you guys for this interview. So I, I think out of 32 advertisers, I think I only lost six, and I've gained back nine. 
So I'm actually ahead three in the middle of the worst pandemic with the entire world closed and the entire world shut down. But see, I know how to pitch things like this. Always pitching, never pitching, pitching relentlessly. I kept calling up advertisers who I thought would be really good during a pandemic, and I tell them who I am, give them a great pitch, and then tell them, listen, I have more people than ever listening to my radio show because no one's working. So all they have to do is sit home and listen to the radio. They're scared. They want to hear what's going on. They want to get good information. I'm the guy. My radio ratings are through the roof. I have more people listening than ever before. You want to be on my show. And six left and nine came on. So I'm plus three during the worst pandemic in history. And, oh, by the way, I'm friends with every radio executive in the country and in Las Vegas, where I am, everybody says they've lost 90% of their advertisers. The ones who are doing well have lost 70% of their advertisers because no one's open. So why would you advertise? Wayne Root has kept, uh, when you add in the new ones, over 100%. I've added. That's the power of relentless. In the middle of a pandemic with people dying and worried about dying, I've added advertisers. I'm an, a walking neon advertisement for my own philosophy, power of relentless. <laughs> so, Wayne, can you talk to us about how, you know, you mentioned that Trump endorsed your book and he never does that. How did you decide that with somebody, you know, the odds were against you. So why did you even go about trying that? Well, well I I guess that's the point of relentless. In other words, you yeah. don't worry about the odds. You know, you don't worry about all the idiots out there. You know, no statue was ever built to honor a critic. Who gives a crap what a critic says? Screw you. You know, I don't, I've been in this a podcast. I could probably say whatever I want. How about F you? I won't say the word, but I'll say F you, middle finger to every critic in America. You know, I couldn't care less what a critic says about me. And I've got more than my share of critics. As a matter of fact, there's some famous guy out there. I can't remember who it was probably every good politician who ever lived, who said, you know, if you don't have a lot of critics, you're doing something wrong. So the more you do right, the more people criticize you, because A, you're out there a lot, so you're going to get criticism. If you weren't out there, you wouldn't get criticism. You know, you weren't famous. So you've got to be doing something right. You're becoming so famous, lots of people criticize you. And B, most people are jealous, jealous, envious losers. So the people who criticize me, I always look them up and I find them. You know, I'm a pretty good super sleuth. I can find anybody on, like, Facebook, Twitter, I, uh, Google. I just find everybody, and I read about them, and they're always losers when they criticize me. I've never been criticized by a successful person in my life. They're always just people who've done nothing in life, and they're sitting in their little homes, scared to death of life, no success, waiting for an EBT card or a welfare check or food stamps, and they got the nerve to criticize me, who's out there fighting all the time. And just, that's why, you know, I laughed at the unfair criticism of Trump. When people said, Trump has failed so many times, he's a loser. No, that just means he's been out there putting himself on the line thousands of times. Of course some of them are going to lose. Like I said, what do you call a guy who fails at 9 out of 10 restaurants? Millionaire. What do you call a guy who fails at four casinos? Billionaire, obviously. So it's not so bad to <laughs> fail. You know, my very first book out of... Uh, what have I written now? I've even written 12 or 13 books. You know you write a lot of books when you lose track. I, I've written 12 or 13 books. The first one was called The Joy of Failure. And it was the stories of all the people who failed their way to the top. They failed, they failed, they failed, and one day they were millionaires or billionaires. And it's because you keep trying. Every time they knock you down, you get back up. And, man, I get knocked down a lot, a lot. There's a famous joke about a guy who walks in a bar, walks up to a strange woman and says, I want to make love to you right here, right now on the bar. The woman slaps him in the face, kicks him in the groin. He's on the ground gasping for air, and a guy walks up to him and says, did you know that lady? And he says, no, never met her in my life. And he says, and you asked her to make love right now, right here? And he said, yeah. He said, how often do you do that? He says, all the time. He says, man, you must get kicked a lot. He says, yeah, but I also make love a lot. And <laughs> that's my point. It's, all, it's a numbers game, man. It's one out of 20 at all times. So who cares if you fail 19? In order to get the one win, you've got to do it 20 times and get the, the air knocked out of you and, and, and kicked in the gut at least 19 out of 20 to get that one success. And that's what most people don't, don't understand. And, and the only reason I understood it is because that's my personality. You know, I'm a typical, you know, go after it, go after it, go after it till I get a yes and turn no into yes. And my dad was the exact opposite. Love him dearly. He was the best father I could ever have because really in the end what it matters with a father is not how successful he is, but how much he loves you. And my mom and dad both loved me very much and gave me a great, you know, background of, of love and said, I love you every day. So I had great parents. But my father never made any money. He was a butcher, and he just never made any money. 
And the reason, as I analyzed his life, as I was a kid, I said, he's not making money because he's not trying. He won't leave the butcher store. I must have pitched him on 20 different ideas and 20 different careers and 20 different things to do in his butcher store. You know, you're not making money. It's failing. So close it down and let's turn it into a different kind of store. And no matter what I said, my father said, no, cutting meat's the only thing I know how to do since I'm, you know, 22 years old. So I'm just going to keep it as a butcher store, even though it's failing. At least it makes a little, a little bit of money, and I bring meat home every night so the family eats steak every night. That was his attitude. And I kept saying, but why, Dad? You're not making any money. Why keep a store that doesn't make money? And so it, it finally dawned on me that the key to life is you've got to try. You've got to put yourself out there. And most people never do. They spend their lives in quiet desperation. They spend their lives never taking risks. And they spend their lives with a safe job or a safe paycheck or maybe just a government paycheck. You know, maybe they're on welfare or food stamps. They just want to collect that little tiny check that's enough to help them survive. But they'll never thrive in their life. And, and I find that even goes, you know, in like vacations. When I take vacations, I love to hike. And I'll go to a national park, you know, Yellowstone, Grand Teton Park, whatever. And there's like a hiking trail. And the first mile is always jammed on a busy Saturday or a busy Sunday. Jammed. And I'll walk that mile, and there's beautiful things to see. But then I go to mile two, and there's about half as many people. And I go to mile three, and there's almost no people. And I, go, I hike to mile four, and there's literally nobody but me. And the prettiest sights are all around mile four. And it's just me and my family seeing those pretty sights all by ourselves. Everybody else is too lazy, too stupid. I don't know what the word to use to describe them. They just get out of a tour bus and they walk that first half mile. Then they turn around and go back to the bus. They missed everything that matters in life because they weren't willing to go the road less traveled. They weren't willing to go a little higher, which maybe makes you out of breath, which maybe risk your life climbing a little bit of a steep mountain. You know, maybe somebody out of shape would have a heart attack or an asthma attack. I don't know. But I work out an hour a day. It doesn't bother me. So I go that hour. My kids are with me. We go that hour extra, that three miles extra. And we're in the most beautiful place in the world. And there's nobody else there with us. Why? It's only four miles in. Now ask me if I'd ever climb a real mountain. No. Do I jump out of airplanes? No. Am I willing to go like, you know, eight miles? No. So, I mean, I don't even do extreme things. It's reasonable to go four miles. It's not reasonable to go eight or 10 or 20. I've never run a marathon. I don't exert myself to the point of like, there's only 12 people in the world that can do it or are willing to do it. I just go that little extra mile or two and nobody's ever there. So it's a reasonable thing to go that extra mile, and nobody ever does it but me. And I'm sure there's one guy somewhere that does another eight miles beyond me, but he gets diminishing returns. Because if it's pretty at mile four, my guess is it never gets much prettier at mile eight and nine and ten, and you just worn yourself out. So, so I only take smart risks, and I don't go to the extra nine miles. I just go the extra four, and it's the road less traveled. There's nobody else there, and I see great stuff. I don't need another four beyond that. That's not asking a lot. Most people never do that. Their whole lives suck. And by the way, part of my philosophy, if you read The Power of Relentless, it isn't really about money. It's about being mentally and physically fit. So I work out an hour a day, seven days a week, and that doesn't even include the fact that I take an hour walk with my dog as well every day. I don't even count walking as exercise. Walking's like mental. You know, walking puts you in a good mood. But walking doesn't lose you any weight or doesn't make you really fit. Walking's great mentally and emotionally. So I do that every day too. But just pure exercise in the gym every day, pull-ups, push-ups, dips, um, and then all my exercise machines in the gym, and then weights. That's an hour a day. Every day I'm physically fit. And so I was never scared of coronavirus. This thing does not attack you if you, like me, are a workout maniac and you eat healthy organic food and you take the proper vitamins. In my opinion, it's always been good for me. In the last 20 years, I haven't had a cold. In the last 20 years, I haven't had the flu. So it never even occurred to me to worry about coronavirus. So, you know, the average person doesn't take the vitamins, doesn't eat organic food, uh, eats tons of carbohydrates, which are poison, lots of bread and cookies and cupcakes, poison, lots of soda, poison. They smoke, they drink, they do drugs, poison. I don't do any of that stuff. So that's why I'm healthy. Coronavirus isn't going to get me. 
I'm like freaking Superman. So that's the attitude you need in life. Am I really Superman? No. I'm sure there's kryptonite somewhere waiting for me around the corner. But I believe I'm Superman, and that has led me to a great life. And it's led me to overcome all the no's and all the failures and all the rejections and not spend my life hiding in my house worrying about some you know, invisible germ that's going to get me. The key to life is all of that, physical fitness, mental fitness, emotional fitness. I begin each day with prayer. I begin each day with meditation. I do a little bit of yoga. Then I work out for an hour, walk my dogs, and I'm ready to attack life. And life doesn't attack me. I attack life. That's all about being relentless. So you mentioned that you know, you've know you looked up all the people who criticize you. Now, a lot of people you'll hear say, I don't pay attention to my haters. I don't pay attention to the distractors. Why do you decide to pay attention to them? Well, I don't. I don't spend a lot of attention. You know, I just, if somebody's a huge critic, I mean, somebody's a thorn in my side. I, I don't, as an example, ever look at anybody on Facebook or Twitter who criticized me. I don't even go near those. And there are probably thousands. I mean, I used to look maybe eight years ago when I first began on Twitter, and it would just annoy me and ruin my day to see somebody say miserable things about me or lots of people say nasty things. So at some point, I decided never to look at those again. I never have. But I'm talking about major, major critics. Uh, you know, who, who just never stop, who are relentless, by the way, ironically, relentlessly big critics of mine. I usually look them up because I'm trying to find an Achilles heel to go after them and debate them and, and defeat them and, and destroy them the same way they want to destroy me. So I pay attention to maybe really big league critics. I don't pay attention to all the little ones on Twitter and Facebook. As a matter of fact, I delete them. They don't even, they don't even have access to my account anymore. You say one bad thing about me, you're not on my page anymore. And some of them, like the last parting shot might be, oh, you're going to delete me. That, oh, you're not, you're not fair. Really? It's my Facebook page. It's for fans of Wayne Root. If you're not a fan, have a nice life. Delete. You're gone. So you just don't let those people even get in your life. But if, if you're about to debate somebody or, you know, you're trying to get them to come on my TV show or my radio show to debate me and, you know, I'm looking up their story of their life. Uh, and, and I realize we're going to have a big battle. I want to know the most I can about him. So that's where I'm a super sleuth, just with major, major people, not with all the little ones in the world. I should say, Wayne, you wrote the foreword to my book, Trump Book, and the first sentence in that book comes from your foreword, and it's a Reddit message that you received from one of your critics, quote, you're a f***ing moron. I hope your father <laughs> gets AIDS and then f***s you in your stupid mouth with his AIDS dick, end quote. That's how my book, Trump Book, starts. So, uh, <laughs> I don't even remember that. I don't remember that critic, thank God. Uh, but that's kind of the quality of the people that are on, you know, on the Internet attacking any one of us who's successful. They're just low-life losers, and they've got nothing else to say except incredibly nasty things. And you know what's really funny about it? It's always anonymous. The thing about me is I'm always in your face, and my name is right there for you to see. You know, everybody knows when I'm criticizing someone, it's Wayne Allen Root criticizing them. And my, my email is WayneRoot at gmail.com. There, anybody can reach me, WayneRoot at gmail.com. And I'll tell them my Facebook and my Twitter. And, you know, I'm never hiding when I criticize someone. But whenever people criticize me, most of the time, 99% they're anonymous. So it just shows you what chicken shit they are is because they just will never give their name when they criticize you because they're anonymous little losers sitting in a bedroom in mommy's house at the age of 38 smoking pot all day long. So that, that's your typical you know, idiot on the Internet that criticizes anyone. And so I've learned to laugh at them. Just, just ignore them. Laugh at them. They're just losers. Yeah, and you know, I, I say all the time, if you want everyone to love you, just be a big failure or a loser because people will feel sorry for you and they'll never consider you to be a threat or a competitor. And that's why I knew Donald Trump was going to win in 2016 because people couldn't get off of him. The media, regular individuals, social media, right. they couldn't stop going after him. And, and they're still doing it right now. And I say, and, and of course, that's what, and by the way, Naresh, that's what I'm trying to say is that if you're not a winner in life, you won't have critics. If you have critics, it's because you are a winner in life. So, you know, if you're not getting critics, you're not working hard enough. You need to have critics. If nobody's saying bad things about you, then you're not out there and you're not giving it 110% and you're not a hustler and you're not relentless. Yeah, yeah. So, all our listeners out there, send us the heat, you know? We, we, we don't want just the good stuff. Send us the bad stuff, too, what you don't want to talk about us. But, Wayne, so question. There are a lot of our listeners, uh, they're, they're at home right now, still under lockdown. Who knows how long? This is probably going to go on for the rest of the year informally. So what are your tips to start and grow a business from home outside of being relentless? 
Well, I don't know. You're hitting me, you know, with that question out of the blue. I had no idea it was coming. So, I mean, my first answer is you shouldn't be at home hiding. If you're at home hiding, you're probably never going to start a business. You're not the personality who should start a business. You should actually just be a worker bee for the rest of your life for someone else who's brave and heroic and willing to fight. You know, as I, I call businessmen and women in America first responders. You know, the same way police are heroes and they rush towards the sound of a bullet or bullet fire, and the same way firemen are heroes, they rush towards the smell of smoke and the rest of us run away, and the same way military guys and gals are heroes because they're willing to die for their country and for their family and for their community and for history and for, their, you know, for the American flag. Those are all heroes. Well, I think business people are heroes. They're first responders. We're willing to die. I'll go face coronavirus, and I'll die. And if you don't want to face it, you stay home, and you hide behind the covers, and that's fine. You have every right to do that. That's what makes America so great, and that's what I think makes my philosophy so great. I'm a, I'm a conservative and a libertarian, which means I believe in freedom, and I believe in free speech, and I believe in free actions and choice. And so if you want to stay home and hide, you have every right to. I'm going to go out there. I have every right to keep my business open while government is saying close it. You know what my answer is? Screw you. Let's see you stop me. And so I've been doing business for seven weeks while the whole world was shut down, and I dare you to stop me. You can't stop me. But the key is I don't have a retail store. I, I work out of my home, so nobody could stop me. So my first thing is if you're hiding, you're not going to be successful, and you don't have the personality to be a business person. My second thing is I think the future of America – and I know Mark Cuban just said the same thing. Mark and I go back a long way. He knows me. I know him. We email each other. Mark Cuban and I are, are very similar in many ways, although our politics are different. But Mark Cuban just gave an interview, and he said, this is going to change the way business is done. More and more people are going to work at home. And I agree. I think that my way of doing things my whole life is going to be the new norm, which is you work at home. There's no reason to have a retail store. There's no reason for employees to be in an office you know, where they have to drive an hour in traffic every day. You could save the hour each way and have two hours of extra time for either doing more work and becoming very successful or maybe more play with your kids, your significant other, and your dogs. You know, either way, you get two hours extra in a day if you don't commute. And I've said this in all my books. It's nothing new. I've been writing about this since like 1997 when I wrote The Joy of Failure. I always said you want to work from home. I, there used to be a magazine called Work From Home. I don't think it exists anymore, but I was on the cover of the magazine sitting in a lounge chair with a laptop on my lap in my Malibu house right by the pool overlooking the beautiful blue Pacific Ocean. You know, and that's always been my life. I believe you get more done when you're home and you're around the things that are beautiful to you and the things you love, and you never have to commute, so you, you save all that time in a day. So you better be really focused and really constructive and, and work hard, you know, as harder than anybody else during the, you know, eight or ten hours a day that you're working because you know you're going to spend some time playing because you're home. So you really got to focus while you're working, and I've always been good at that. And so I think that's the future of our country. I think it's the future of work in the world. More and more people are going to telecommute and work from home, which means they're around their kids and their dogs and their plants and their flowers and their beautiful home and the things they love in life, and they never have to uh, you know, risk their life in a car accident or, or you know, never pay a lot of money for insurance because they're not driving that much. And how about this one? I may be a conservative, but I think it's good for the environment. If everybody stays home, pollution will drop dramatically, and all the people screaming for green energy and the Green New Deal, you'll automatically get it without doing a darn thing or spending a penny. Government doesn't have to spend one penny. Just keep most of your employees home. You know, of course, monitor them. And if they're home and they get no work done, fire them. But if they're home and they can manage to get the same amount of work done or more, then they should stay at home forever. You don't need them to come to an office. Well, that'll dramatically decrease traffic and dramatically decrease pollution uh, all over the United States and therefore lower, the, lower lung cancer and other, other forms of cancer that come from pollution. So I, I think there's a lot of benefits that can come from a terrible pandemic like coronavirus. People's lifestyles are being changed. They're going to do more stuff online and more stuff at home and far less stuff at an office ever again and far less commuting. So, you know, the only thing I can tell you is I don't know what business to get in. I know whatever business you do, it's got to be something you know and that you love and feels good to you, and you always do better in life when you love what you're doing. It's got to be something you have a special knack for, but it's got to be now done online, in my opinion. The days of retail stores are over. Their history. Yeah, almost every retail store in America is on the verge of going out of business. So you don't want to own a retail store. You want to do it out of your home, thereby saving so much money in rent to a landlord for an office or for a retail store. And you want it to be a business where you can sell something online. 
because that's what people are going to do from now on. They're going to shop online. They're not going to go out to a store because they're going to think it's too dangerous to go out to a store. I don't agree, as I told you throughout this interview. I just think, you know, people are being way too weak on this thing. This is a, a nasty, nasty, nasty flu that kills very old and very sick people. And everybody else, we should spend all the money protecting very old, very sick people. And everybody else should be out working and living life and really not changing a thing except for maybe wearing masks and practicing a little bit of social distancing. But you could just carry on your life the way you always did. There's no reason to hide over a nasty, nasty flu that kills old people, sick people, unless you're old and sick. If you are, protect yourself, hide indoors. If you aren't, don't hide. Go out and do, earn your living. You know, that's my advice in life. But, but on the other hand, wouldn't you be more protected if you did it at home? If your living is at home, then you don't have to worry about this stuff. So I think it just so happens that quite naturally, the very things I'm recommending, working from home and building an online business, are the perfect tools to move forward in the business world in the age of coronavirus. So what tips or resources for people who are looking to to start their business from home? Kind of what, what things can you say to them to help them get started? You know, I, I just, I, I really am a broken record. You know, I've, I've got the same Adam and Naresh, I've got the same exact advice, which is do something you love and attack all day long, always be on offense and be relentless and have faith in you and have faith in God and pitch, not bitch, don't complain, just keep pitching and follow up like a madman and be loud, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, be bold, have courage and attack, attack, attack. You know, Banzai, attack, 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 Torah, Torah, Torah. Have lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm, be optimistic. Those are the traits you need to be successful. Now, as far as your question, you know, where do you go get resources? That's everybody's, everybody's big question. Everybody in the world needs money. And so, look, I know what I'm good at. I can't tell the next person what they're good at. I'm good at pitching people and getting them to write a check. So I'm not one of those guys that's ever gone to a bank. I've never gone to the SBA, the Small Business Administration. I'm a guy who comes up with an idea, puts together a beautiful package and a deck, you know, a beautiful PowerPoint deck and a beautiful uh, a PPM, you know, and, and a legal document. And then I go out and start pitching investors. And, you know, out of every 20 people, one or two write a check for 50, 100 grand. Next thing you know, I've raised a million dollars after three months of talking to people. That's how I raise money. That doesn't mean that's how you have to do it. But, you know, that's a very interesting way to do it. Not too many people understand how to do that anymore. But there are not too many people that make the kind of money that I make either anymore. So I think the way to do it is you've got to be a people person. You can't do my style of business without being a people person. If you invite 20 people in a room to pitch them on an idea, you better have a bigger-than-life personality. You better be fun. You better be high energy. You better be enthusiastic. Your face better glow. You better be good at shaking hands, kissing babies, and slapping backs. You know, I'm like a born politician, which means you're a born salesman, which means you can make money selling anything. That's the only thing I know, guys. I can't teach someone what I don't know. That's the way I make money, and it's never changed for me. I'm 58 years old now, and I started this when I was 21. So you do the math. I've been doing this almost 40 years, and it's never changed. Wayne Allen Root, awesome, awesome summary of your key points. You're the founder of Winning Edge, former Libertarian VP nominee, author of the number one best-selling book, The Power of Relentless, Seven Secrets to Achieving Mega Success, Financial Freedom, and the Life of Your Dreams. Check out that book and all of his. He's had 13, 14 different books, all available on Amazon. Highly recommend all of them. Uh, any final last parting thoughts, Wayne? Sure. You know, if you like my politics, by the way, you can go to my website, rootforamerica.com, and you can find all my videos and all my commentaries and all my columns and also where I'm next appearing and speaking at an event. So remember that, you know, what do I do all day? I root for America. I'm a big believer in American, American exceptionalism, and I root for America. So the website is root, R-O-O-T, for America.com. And if you want someone like me on your team, if you are starting a business or you've got a business, and you want someone like Wayne Root to use my energy and my brand name fame and celebrity to pitch your business, whether it be on a video or whether it be on a TV commercial or a radio commercial, I do that for hundreds of small businesses all over the United States. And I've got a website where you can find out about it. It's WayneRoot.com. 
WayneRoot.com. You go there, and it tells you how to contact me and how to get me to do videos, endorsements, spokesman deals, and also it shows you examples of all the videos I've done for, I don't know, probably a 100 different companies. They're all there, whether they be uh, homemade videos at my home TV studio or whether they be you know, national TV commercials, which I've done for dozens of companies. Uh, I'm a guy whose energy pops out of the screen and gets people excited and gets them to stop surfing the channel and stop when they see me, and next thing you know, you've got 10,000 new customers. So WayneRoot.com. Check it out, and hopefully you'll become a client. Awesome. Well, Wayne, thanks so much for joining us on the Work From Home show. Lots of valuable, uplifting, inspirational information. I know I took a, a, a lot of notes. I'm, I, I'm not a bitcher, that's for sure. And I'm going to share a good segment or a good portion of this interview to the public and to the, the people I know who do like to bitch because it doesn't get you anywhere. So thanks for those kind, inspirational words. All right. Thank you. And, and thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to spread my gospel, the gospel of war, Wayne Hallerut. Really appreciate it, guys. <laughs> WayneRoot.com, RootForAmerica.com. Have yourselves a great day, Adam and Arish. God bless. All right, all right. Take it easy, Wayne. Have a good one. And for all our listeners out there, thanks for listening to another episode of the Work From Home Show. Visit our website at WorkFromHomeShow.com. Get on our mailing list. Like us on all social media. We're everywhere. We're anywhere and everywhere. If you have any questions, hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Hello at workfromhomeshow.com. I'm sure you've got follow-up questions to what Wayne had to say, to the content that he talked about. I know not everyone's going to like what he said, but can't <laughs> take away, Adam. Can't take away the the inspiration that you heard from his and words. The passion. And the pat you could hear the pad. I mean, it was a Wayne Wayne actually only gave us 15 minutes to do this interview. And his passion carried us to like 35 minutes. So really, really passionate guy. And again, hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, any of the platforms that you use. Tell your friends about us. And until next time, keep on working from home. <laughs>